Can you hear it? Yeah? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Hey everyone, I'm Claire Saffitz. Welcome to my home kitchen. Today, out of dessert person, I have a recipe for a flourless chocolate wave cake. And it is a really elegant but easy to put together recipe that fits a number of dietary restrictions. It's dairy free, gluten free. It is really elegant but also easy to make. And I'm gonna show you how to put it together. The name of this recipe is Flourless Chocolate Wave Cake, and it's called that because this is a kind of cake that has egg whites beaten into it, and it rises really tall and then starts to fall as it comes out of the oven. That's intentional. And then as it falls, the top of it kind of ripples and makes this wavy edge that's really pretty, and I think it looks really cool, and so that's why I call it my Flourless Chocolate Wave Cake. But I made that up, because I like the way it looked. The sort of heart of this recipe is that you have to make a meringue out of beaten egg white to fold into the chocolate mixture. But it's two bowls, one for melting the chocolate, one for making the meringue. So I have a stand mixer here, and then I also have a setup called a double boiler, which is, that's hot, a saucepan of very, not even simmering water, but just steaming hot water, and then a heat proof bowl on top. I also have a nine inch spring form pan. You could make it in a 10 inch pan, it just won't rise quite as high. Ingredients. So starting with chocolate, I have 10 ounces. I'm using like a semi-sweet chocolate between, I like something between 64 and 72. Half a cup of almond flour. This is a blanched almond flour, so you can see it doesn't have those brown specks from the skin of the almonds. It doesn't matter what you use. You could use another nut flour as well. Some granulated sugar, neutral oil, I'm using vegetable oil, six large eggs, a little vanilla extract, and amaretto. You could use rum, you could use bourbon, any kind of brown aged liquor works great. The first step is to start melting my chocolate mixture. I have a large bowl here. I'm gonna add my 10 ounces of chocolate. This is a combination of, I had like a little bit of these baking discs left and then I bought like the bar chocolate. So I just broke it up into pieces. Now three tablespoons of amaretto. In most cases, like you can omit alcohol, but it's almost like adding soy sauce to a recipe. It's like this aged product that has a lot of complexity and a lot of flavor and also enhances the other flavors in the cake. And I'm gonna add a quarter cup of water. I'm adding a half cup of neutral oil. You could use olive oil, there's no reason why you couldn't. You just don't really taste it in the final cake, so I don't see much of a point of using a good olive oil. You could use avocado oil, grape seed. So I'm gonna put this over my saucepan. I have maybe three quarters of an inch, or even that, of water in here. You can see it's steaming. You don't want this to be boiling. You want it to be a gentle heat. You basically, when you melt chocolate, you wanna do so gently. So I'm gonna let this sit here. While that's heating up and melting, I will prepare our pan. I use this for like the cheesecake episode. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to just lightly oil it using some additional vegetable oil and a pastry brush. So I oil the bottom and then the sides. And when you're doing it, go all the way up to the very top of the sides. This cake, because it's lightened with egg white, the air warms and expands and the cake rises taller <laughs> and higher than the sides of the cake, which is why you want to grease it all the way to the very, very top so that it doesn't get stuck and then like settle unevenly. I know I've been talking about it in this season of Dessert Person, but I'm obsessed with the silicone pan liners. So, so easy and nothing sticks to them. I'll still go ahead and oil it a little bit. I'm going to toss some sugar inside the pan and coat everything. Is there a name for those things on like a rock climbing wall that are like the grip things? Yeah, they're called rock. They're called rocks. They're like grips. The sugar acts as little grippy areas for the cake to climb onto and it helps it rise. So if you've ever made like a souffle, it just helps things to like rise higher and create traction. When you're separating eggs, even if the recipe calls for room temperature eggs, it's a good idea to separate them while they're still cold because the yolk will hold together much more firmly and you are less at risk of puncturing the yolk and then possibly getting some in the whites and then you don't have egg whites that whip up as airy. So I'm gonna do, oh, I'm gonna do whites in here. Sometimes I get confused and I put them in the wrong bowl. There's all sorts of tricks for separating eggs. I like to just do the back and forth in the shell. The main thing that you wanna do is just avoid getting any yolk in the white because then you kinda have to start over. It's better to have a little white in the yolk, that won't hurt anything, than any yolk in the white. 
you're going to put the whites, go ahead and plug it, plug it into your stand mixer. The sugar is going to be for the egg whites. Oh, I forgot an ingredient, you guys. Salt. <laughs> Salt, that's one of them. Sorry, add that to the list. So now I have this melted smooth chocolate mixture. So what I wanna do now is add my yolks and then whisk that in vigorously. Now at this point, you can see that the mixture is looking a little bit broken. When I say broken, it means that like the fat has separated out from the other solids. It will come back together. So the egg yolks are gonna do their thing, which is to emulsify all the ingredients. So once those are worked in really thoroughly, you can add the almond flour. This is a half cup. Go ahead and whisk really thoroughly and whisk until you see the mixture come back together. So it looks really smooth and glossy and thick like brownie batter, but there is a graininess to it because of the little particles of ground almonds. That's the almond flour. Now that I have this beautiful chocolate mixture, I can turn to the egg whites. I have the whisk attachment on my stand mixer. So I'm adding a teaspoon of salt. So I'm gonna start mixing this on low to just break up the whites. So once you've broken up the whites and they're a little more liquid, you can increase the speed. I'll go to like medium high. When the mixture goes white and foamy, that's when you can start incorporating your sugar. You wanna wait until that point, otherwise you won't get a meringue that's as light. And you'll see that the texture is gonna really transform. It's gonna become dense and glossy. You're not gonna be able to see the air bubbles. I increase the speed to high just for a few seconds after I added all the sugar. Now I wanna check the texture because you do not wanna over whip meringue. I would say that's actually a pretty firm peak. So look at how nice that looks. So this is good. I'm ready. The, oh wait, I gotta add the vanilla. I forgot the vanilla, I'm sorry. I add vanilla to the egg whites after I've beaten them and that is partly to protect against overbeating. When you add a little bit of liquid like vanilla extract, it will just help smooth out the egg whites. So if, you've, if you have overbeaten them, this will loosen them a little bit. So that's all that needs. So you don't have to be too gentle at this stage. You're just trying to quickly work them together and incorporate them. And the color is gonna go from really intense dark brown to a lighter brown because of those egg whites. And you can see that the texture is already quite different. You are trying to take what's on the bottom of the bowl and transfer it to the top. So that's that kind of folding over motion. So you're using preferably a large flexible spatula like this. And it is a scraping motion against the side of the bowl and the bottom. And then a flick of the wrist to turn it from the bottom over onto the top. I'm gonna add about half of the remaining meringue. This is one of my favorite things to do in all of baking is to fold meringue into a chocolate cake batter because it's so pretty. I love the streaks that it forms so folding is a gentle way of incorporating two things. And I wanna be gentle because the more you work beaten egg whites, the more you'll deflate them and cause them to lose that airy texture. Truth be told, I did overbeat this meringue a little bit. You can see that edge. That's what overbeaten meringue looks like. Certainly not the end of the world, I've done it before. So I'm going to pour my batter into my prepared pan. Now, because I slightly overbeat the meringue, you might see like a little patch of meringue going in. See like that little piece, that's like a piece of meringue that didn't incorporate, see that? But no big deal. It's, you're still gonna have a very light cake. So I'm gonna scrape everything in. As a final step, I give the surface of the cake a very generous dusting of sugar. That beautiful, delicate wave that sets on top of the cake, that happens because of the granulated sugar that I sprinkle over top. So in the recipe, it calls for a measured amount. It's two tablespoons. I'm kind of eyeballing it here. But it should be enough to coat the surface visibly in the sugar. I love the texture contrast that you get with having that on the surface. That looks good. This is gonna go into the oven at 350. And it doesn't take that long to bake. It goes about 35 minutes. And I'll check it with a cake tester because I want a tester to come out clean. The whole kitchen started to smell like chocolate, so that's how I know it's getting close. And I'm going to check it while it's still in the oven, so I have my cake tester. For anyone wondering why I keep this here, it's so I can do this and be ready. It's just very handy. It's like a little holding area. These are just for testing things as they come out of the oven. And it's just like I can easily pluck it 
and I always keep it right here front and center. And I'm gonna just puncture through the top and my cake tester is not clean, although it's close, so it, it'll be ready soon. I'll show you what the cake tester looks like. It doesn't have a lot of batter stuck to it, but it's still a little wet. So I would say another maybe three minutes and then I'll pull it out. It looks so pretty. I love how the sugar doesn't dissolve into the cake. The lid stays flat and then everything else in the cake kind of has a wave, <laughs> it waves. And it doesn't immediately sink, but as it cools, it gradually falls. And you hit a jet right now. <laughs> if, if I try to unmold it. Yeah. It's so delicate at this stage, it's hot. The egg hasn't set yet because it's still hot. So if I were to unmold it, it would come apart in the pan and fall, just fall apart. So we are gonna let this cool completely in the pan. That's very important. And you can see it's already started to settle a little bit, even though you can't like see it happening, but I can see that the height's gone down a bit. So here's the cool cake. It doesn't have a ton of structure and you end up not getting a clean cut when it's hot because the cake is just fragile and very tender. So this is obviously cooled. There's a cakiness to it, it has a crumb, but it also maintains an airiness where when you bite it, like you get texture, you get the almond flour, but there's also a kind of dissolving sensation. Plus when it comes to chocolate, because I feel like so many chocolate desserts can be overpowering and I feel like I need a palate cleanser in between bites. Like I gotta, you know, take a bite, take a sip of water or something. This I think is not overpowering in that way because it's so light. Can you hear that? It's like a, like little air bubbles popping. That's, it's so moussey. Mm. Mm, it's really good. And it's also like not, for how not sweet it is, I don't think it's overpoweringly bitter either. There's only a half cup of sugar in the entire cake, plus what's on top and on the sides of the pan. You can really taste the chocolate. This is the kind of chocolate cake I wanna eat, not the super like dense, fudgy. I don't need all that. I just want something that has lightness to it, but also intensity. Part of the reason I designed this cake to be dairy-free is so it's perfect for Passover. So if you are someone who doesn't want a dairy dessert because you're having meat at your Passover meal, and so you're keeping things kosher. This is the perfect cake because there's no flour and no dairy. Anyway, I hope you try it. It is like an evergreen chocolate cake, really good for people on a gluten-free diet or on a no dairy diet. And I think you could serve it and no one would miss a thing. Thank you for watching Dessert Person and like and subscribe. You can hear her purring, she's purring. <laughs> she doesn't, I don't think she likes looking at you guys.